And there's some learning objectives so for this session. So it is to compare the footwear needed for males and females, critique the current football boot market, and to um, compose some useful footwear suggestions for female footballers. Um, and with that, uh, research ideas and opportunities. So a bit of background about me, but before we talk about me, I'd much rather talk about the team uh, that we have, um, and there the, you are, Ethel, um, together with uh, Quiva and Daniel, um, a very international group, um, one in Ireland, one in Aspita, one in Australia, and myself in the UK, uh, three podiatrists and myself, all very interested in sports footwear uh, and answering the what we believe are the questions needed in in sports footwear and more specifically in football boots. Um, Kriva was a former student of mine. She's working a lot on uh, academy football boots and the issues we have there, but we all sort of sit together uh, and try and uh, answer the questions around the women's football boots. So myself, I have quite a mixed background. I have um, a degree in sports rehabilitation in biomedical engineering and a PhD in sports technology on football boot testing, men's football boot testing. Um, and as, uh, as just mentioned, I'm a lecturer at two different universities and I do a lot of research around three sort of main areas, which are football boots, uh, women's football and technology in football. So they also come together nicely uh, for this talk today, I hope. And uh, as, uh, as Mark also kindly mentioned, I am part of the FIFA and the UEFA group uh, both for research and for education, and I collaborate a lot with uh, externals uh, in the football world, whether that being clubs and, and national teams, and uh, and uh, industrial partners, trying to to make the research um, have effects where it really needs to have the effect, rather than sitting in parallel. So let's go back to the football boot basics and have a little bit of discussion around this. So a football boot uh, is, uh, as described in, uh, as, uh, by Athol in our um, very recent, um, just published actually, uh, um, Aspita, um journal paper on football boots uh, as a modern, uh, well, the modern football boot being uh, the equivalent of a Swiss army knife. It has a lot of... Um, requirements and, and uh, that might seem logical for any foot, any footwear but when you think about it a football boot needs to interact with the player wearing it occasionally it interacts with the opponent so it needs to be safe uh, and it interacts with the surface it has to interact with the ball so pretty much every single element of the boot has to be of optimal performance whether that being the upper the outsole um, insole um, etc. And when you look at it um, from a sort of sports technology perspective, we always look at it from a sort of a holy trinity. So in sports technology, we always focus on these three things when we design equipment. And that's performance, it's safety, and it's experience. So performance and safety are two things we always have to balance out. So you can make a football boot with uh, amazing grip to make you accelerate really fast. Well, if you do that, you probably need long studs, and those long studs would risk being stuck in the ground uh, and therefore increase the uh, injury risk when cutting or turning. So it's finding that optimal balance between performance and safety always in the design. And then there's the experience, which is the bit which is often neglected, but probably the most important bit uh, for actually ensuring that the, the product is sold on the market which is the experience. So experience can be anything from is this comfortable to mm, I don't like it in green, I prefer it in blue, so I'm not going to buy it. Uh, or this looks very different from what I'm used to and I'm therefore not going to like it because I'm going to look different on the pitch from everyone else. So a lot of considerations um, to take into account when you design a football boot. Um, and um, it's interesting to talk about football boots because it is one of the few risk factors which is uh, extrinsic and modifiable in in uh, in football so we have a lot of 
intrinsic modifiable factors that we often talk about, such as strength, um, flexibility, um, fatigue, etc. Um, and we have uh, uh, some non-modifiable things such as like re-injury or, or the pitch itself, where we can discuss whether or not the pitch is modifiable or not, but um, it's limited people who have access to actually changing these factors. So yeah, the football boot is quite unique in the fact that it is extrinsic and it is modifiable. And when you look at it from an evidence-based perspective, um, we recently in the FIFA group uh, that was just mentioned, uh, we recently published a paper um, looking at the research conducted in women's football. So we did a big scoping review, searching for all literature published on women's football, and found 32 papers looking at equipment. Well, equipment can be many things, so just looking at a game scenario like this, I found multiple different factors that can be assessed under the category of equipment so everything from the kits socks shin pads the ball the pitch the gloves the goal uh to factors that aren't currently implemented in women's football like bar and goal line technology um and then of course the football boot and yes well when you know when i broke it down even further from those 32 papers there were only two mentioning women and football boots um, so not a lot of evidence, as I said, to, to, to base this talk on, unfortunately, but highlighting that a lot of research still needs to be done. So what are the requirements for uh, football boots for women? Um, I'm going to flip this around a little bit. Um, but we are going to talk about three key areas. Um, so fit and shape, bending point, and outsole. I could talk about many more, but these are the ones I've picked for the session today. We'll start with fit and shape. And I'll, yeah, as I said, flip this around a little bit and I'll get you guys to reflect on something maybe a little bit odd, but uh, hopefully it'll all make sense in a second. So do you own a pair of running shoes? And if you do, did you buy your running shoes or do you know anyone who's bought their running shoes based on their running style or their foot features? So are they a four foot runner, a heel striker? Are they a pronator, a supinator, flat feet? Do they need extra support in their running shoes? In the running shoe industry, um, it used to be at least, um, and it probably still is very focused on um, control, protection, and comfort, and making sure that, um, that it is, uh, as it says in one of the adverts, that racing um, shoes should uh, be easy to forget. So something that you don't think about wearing that is so comfortable that it's sort of part of you almost. There is some focus on performance in terms of speed today, but we still very much buy our running shoes based on fitting it to the individual. I'm sure most of you have seen uh, these scenarios before, whether it is just fitting and testing that a boot fits your foot uh, to scanners, um, treadmill testing, uh, and 3D motion analysis of running shoes. These are all accessible um, to runners of different levels. And, um, and we can, of course, discuss the quality of these, but that's beyond the talk for today. But I think the key message here is that we try and fit uh, the running shoe to the, the person wearing it. So we have to find a good fit between you, the runner, and the running shoe. So now let's flip it around. And uh, I'll ask you if you own a pair of football boots or know someone who wears um, football boots. It might be your kids, um, your friends. Have they bought or have you bought them based on your running style or your foot features? Probably not. Um, did you instead or did they instead buy them based on performance features or uh, wanting to become something that um, everyone else uh, wants to be? So did you buy the boot that Messi or Ronaldo is wearing because you want to be fast, you want to be agile and you want to score goals like they do? So when you look at the football boot marketing in contrast to the running shoe marketing, uh, it's all performance focused. So you have four categories of football boots. We have the speed boot, we have the 
the touch control kind of boots. We have the power boots and we have the heritage boots. So three of those are purely performance focused. So making you faster, making you better at dribbling and passing or making you better at shooting. At least that's what's claimed. And then you have the outsole heritage uh, or the, the, the heritage football boot, which is like a, a relaunch of older generations, which is more um, a sort of a, a target for older players, generally speaking. So unlike the, the running shoe market, we try to fit the uh, football boot to a dream and not to the individual themselves. So when you go into a shop, like the ones on the image, uh, images here, you can see that you find your boot based on the player you want to be. Or you find images like the ones um, I have uh, highlighted here with what your boot says about you. So if you wear a certain type of boot, you are a certain type of player. And that's evident in the marketing that um, and the player selections currently. So the image here is the Belgian national team at the, at the Euros, the men's national team, I should mention. Um, and you can see that the, the speed boots or the fast boots are, are worn by strikers, wingers. Um, the more heritage kind of boots are worn by defenders and the touch control boots are worn by midfielders and um, goalkeepers. So uh, again, you know, you wear a football boot based on the, the dream that you want to fit rather than who you are as a person and who, what your foot shape looks like and what, how you run. Um, and why do I compare these two? I think there's a there's a there's an interesting um, comparison. If you and uh, apologies, I know I, I am an engineer by training, and this is the only equation you're going to see today. But um, we are, we we know that pressure um, is a force over an area. So when we compare football boots to running shoes, um, force will increase. Why? Because uh, we have less cushioning. Uh, in the insole of the football boot, we have studs underneath, which will uh, locate pressure sort of centrally over those stud areas. And we'll have more intense movements performed generally in running shoes, com uh, in, in football boots, sorry, compared to running shoes. So we'll be jumping, accelerating, decelerating, uh, cutting, whereas in running shoes, we just tend to run. We'll have a decreased area, why? Because our football boots have a smaller area, generally speaking, they're very slim, narrow football boots, and we'll talk more about that later. And there's a tendency amongst players to wear them a size too small, something we need to educate players on anyway, uh, which is just a generic concern from my uh, perspective. So if you are any good at math, you should know that that equation will lead to an increase in pressure in the football boot compared to the running shoe. And there's a quite an old study performed on men, but an interesting one. So just walking around in football boots compared to running shoes increases the planter pressure by 35%. So you should even be more uh, cautious of wearing a football boot that's right for you because the load you put on your feet is even higher than in a running shoe. So it makes no sense to me to not buy a football boot that actually fits you. And to, with that, I just wanted to make a comment about this whole idea that I'm sure you've all heard of, of having to break in your football boots, having to wear them for X amount of time, a few weeks, a month, uh, having to adapt them with putting tennis balls or uh, folded up paper, newspapers in your shoes to make them comfortable and fit your, your foot. When have you ever bought a pair of running shoes thinking that you just have to break them in? So give it another give it a month of running with an uncomfortable running shoe before uh, you think that it's okay to wear it. So what I'm trying to say here is that we wear boots based on performance, but we need to wear them based on fit, whoever you are. So what are the options then as a female? Uh, well, today um, you have three options really, from my perspective. So we have one startup company in Australia looking at have, who have designed football boots for women other than that you can wear men's football boots or you can wait until um, approximately the world cup 2023 when most of the bigger brands are hoping to launch their first women's football boots which is exciting because it gives us a bit of time as researchers to actually have an impact 
on the football boots designed uh, and launched uh, on the market. But as you can see, it's not the ideal scenario necessarily if you are a female uh, at this current time. And why do we need different football boots um, from a fit and shape perspective? Well, um, I'm not going to go too much into details on this, as I'm sure you all know the sex differences, or that there are multiple sex differences between males and females. Everything from muscle mass, fat mass, anatomy, uh, sex hormones, flexibility, um, to sort of more physiological uh, things such as uh, long, uh, long size, heart and blood volume. Um, skeletal muscle fatigue, etc. But there are also gender differences we have to consider. Um, so we know that women tend to wear different uh, shoes off the pitch compared to men, generally speaking. And um, so we have uh, a much more frequent use of heels, or high heels, um, in women, putting a lot of pressure on the forefoot and stressing the foot in a different way that, than it would for, for males. Um, we know that currently um, elite female footballers have uh, a decreased financial earnings, especially from sponsorships, um, which has an impact on how they choose and select their football boots. I'll talk more about that later. And, in, and with that, there's a decrease of perceived power in football. And uh, we're just about to um, publish a paper, uh, an editorial uh, with multiple people within the, the women's football uh, industry, sort of highlighting how technology in women's football is changing and the requirements are changing. And uh, before we used to just be thankful that we would get uh, equipment, uh, maybe even for free from sponsors. But today we slowly start to have that conversation with the sponsors about how they can improve their design so they make them more women specific. So we're changing from a niche to a norm where, as I mentioned in the very start, you know, a few years back when I was doing my PhD, I was told that women's football boot would be a niche, niche and not, not a market that would have any financial gains for a company. But now we're changing it and, you know, we, it is the biggest sport in the world for women. So why is it not the norm? And that is what's slowly changing. Now let's uh, narrow that down to the feet, and I know this is a, a weird area of interest, but it is an interest of mine. And uh, we know that the men and women's feet aren't the same, so we know that women's feet are smaller, but it's more than just shrinking it down to a, a smaller size, because there are different anatomical shapes. This is complex to measure, um, because there are some variability, um, but some of the factors that I've just listed here, I could list many more, um, differences in, in length and ankle of the first meter tarsal, um, wider forefoot relative to the foot length in women, um, a more proximally placed fifth meter tarsal, uh, a higher arch, generally speaking, and of course, um, then a, a, a larger ankle circumference relative to the to the length, and that's really basic measures, but a foot is a complex shape, it's not a square, it's not a circle. So the way we measure it uh, is really complex. And and the I think overall, like these are not just five differences, these are five differences that together with multiple other differences um, really highlight that we have different foot shapes and different requirements for footwear. On top of that, we can complicate it even further, saying that changes in foot uh, shape um, happened throughout uh, foot growth. So through um, childhood and and uh, up until you know, your mid-teens, uh, the foot will probably or more like, most likely change shape with uh, growth in length. Um, there's also um, differences that we should highlight with ethnicity, and I'll talk about that a bit more later. And then, of course, you know, these are means of, uh, of a whole world um, or half of the world's population. And um, so, of course, we're all unique and you know, we can talk about the norm, but whoever really fits the norm anyway. So one of the things I talked about was uh, a wider forefoot. Um, and this is a, an image from, from our um, new Aspetar, um paper. And you can then talk about if you have that wider forefoot, what will happen then? Well, there are two options. 
uh, in, in football boots are really narrow um, in the design today. Um, so you have either an overhang, so meaning that the, the, sh the foot will hang over the edge of the boot, meaning that the first of the fifth meter tassel and toe um, will uh, most likely hang over a really hard uh, edge, which is the plastic from the outsole sort of going up, sort of copping around the, um, uh, the foot, causing a lot of pressure and stress under that area. Or we can have increased pressure internally if the upper is very rigid and you might just have a squeeze from both sides. So we know that the pressure, the plantar pressure is very high, but also the pressure laterally and medially will be increased for a woman's forefoot, putting even more stress on the metatarsal region. We know that women are more likely of having a uh, forefoot or metatarsal uh, stress fractures in, in football. Um, so we know that uh, this is an issue. Uh, whether this is causing it solely is um, difficult to say, but uh, it definitely is a concern that we need to look into. And with that, you know, it's not just about comfort. Yeah, as I said, it's about the like, decrease in comfort often lead to increase in pain and an increase in pain will lead to decrease in load tolerance and lo decrease in load tolerance could lead to increase in injury risk potentially. So something that we want to know more about in the future. And as I said, you know, um, ethnicity is, is a factor when we talk about foot shapes. And the beautiful thing about football is that it's global. Pretty much every ethnic uh, ethnicity on the planet plays football, and therefore football boots should fit uh, the player on the market, meaning every single person on the planet. And I'm not just talking women here, I'm talking men as well. I'll give you an example of a player that was sponsored by a company I've previously worked with, and they told me this story about them uh, signing a, a, a contract with him, a very a prominent player. So that was one of the, that was a key player uh, that they were using for marketing, which meant that they were going to customize football boots for them. He was um, of black, uh, West African origins. And when they came in, uh, well, well, West African origins means that we have a tendency of increased um, football um, foot width. So we have very wide feet compared to the length um, in this population compared to the uh, to the Caucasian foot shape that we normally design uh, football boots based on. So um, the brand comes in, asks uh, what uh, what shoe size he is, and he says he's a size. Uh, 11 or 12, which in European sizes is a 45, 46. He then takes his shoes off and they measure his foot and he's a size 8, a uh, small size 8, so a small size 42 in European sizes. Um, and they, they ask him why and there's like, oh, well, I've always worn boots like this. They took a really interesting image, which I can't show you, unfortunately, but uh, they basically cut the toe box open on the football boot and in there, there is a, a gap of five to six centimeters from the toes to the end of the football boot. He'd already he was already playing international football then, um, scoring most of his goals um, with his head. And you can maybe question whether the football boot fit was the reason for that, because he was basically running around the football pitch in clown shoes just to be able to wear something on his feet, because there was no brand available on the market that had a foot, uh, foot width um, fit that was wide enough for his feet. And as we know, um, the football, even elite football, and if you look at even the um, some of the best leagues in the world, um, like the English uh, Premier League, 25% of players there are uh, of other ethnicities than um, Caucasian white. So it, it's it's crucial, it's everywhere. It's, it, we need to make sure that football boots fit um, the players. And it's not just an issue, as I say, for women, it's an issue for men as well. So I'd love to make this uh, a challenge when designing women's football boots to get this right in the female design even before the men have gotten it right. So why not aim to be even better instead of just being good enough? And why do we bother? Yeah, we bother about fit and shape because, well, we've all worn a, a shoe that's been uh, poorly fitted to our feet and we know that it's it's uncomfortable. 
We know that this is can cause skin conditions, and that's something that we don't know much about in football because most epidemiological studies focus on uh, um, conditions that keep you away from the pitch. Medical staff is, is good enough to manage skin conditions generally, uh, and therefore, if you have a, a blister, you will still be playing, but we all know what it's like playing uh, with or walking around with a blister. Uh, and I can only assume that um, you will not perform optimally if you run around in constant discomfort. And then, of course, there are the injury risks that um, are concerned, but a real challenge to ever test and measure because it is such an individual um, thing to wear football boots uh, and it's a, it's a longitudinal study that is needed to fully understand how football boots are related with injuries. Yet it is an important thing to, to reflect on. So when we talk about fit and shape, what we need to understand is what um, foot shapes of female footballers look like. And I'm talking both static and dynamic here because we know those two are different. We need to understand uh, current issues and we need to, uh, so we need to reach out and actually talk to players, medical staff and get an understanding of where the issues lie. And we need to consider diversity. So bending points, um, let me move on to that. And when I'm talking bending points, I'm talking uh, where the foot bends when we are accelerating uh, in a football boot. So the football boot should follow the foot to so have a natural movement. And this is uh, the key joint that we are looking at. When we then um, take an image of the football boot um, worn by a player in an x-ray, you can see that uh, it almost makes sense that a boot can't just like bend everywhere. Why? Because we have studs and stud alignments underneath the foot where the, the boot will be rigid. And therefore we can't just assume that it will bend where your foot naturally wants to bend. So we need to assess whether that bending point aligns with the joint line. Uh, and why is that important? Well, because if you don't, uh, you're gonna bend over a bone, uh, most likely the meter tarsals, and that will cause discomfort, irritation, potential injury. And as I mentioned before, we know that the length of the meter tarsals relative to the foot length in men and women are different. So this is something we need to understand and we need to assess to understand what the optimal sort of um, stud location in relation to bending point is uh, for women's football boots. So yeah, again, you know, we need to understand what that difference is and is there a difference. And that means we need to understand the foot anatomy. We need to understand the typical bending points of a female versus a male player. And we need to align the shoe bent with that anatomy. So a final point I wanted to highlight is the outsole, especially because Athol is with us today and we all know that Athol is a big fan of traction um, of, uh, I've decided to highlight this and because I think it's an important feature. So when we talk about uh, outsoles in football for anyone who's not an expert, um, we have different outsole types that you can choose from. Generally we have the soft ground, the firm ground, the artificial ground and, and for some a turf ground outsole as well. These um, fit different uh, surfaces because we have different surfaces in football. You can play on natural grass, you can play on artificial grass, or you can play on a hybrid, which is a natural grass with artificial grass uh, inserted into it. And with that, that surface will vary depending on the weather. So I'm sure uh, down in Aspetar, you're familiar with the top image there, the sun. I'm not so sure that you know what the other two mean, but uh, the wet one is when it's raining and we're very familiar with that in, in England. Uh, wet pitches will require different outsoles to uh, not slip. And uh, sometimes we might even have frozen pitches, uh, which is something you might never have seen in Qatar, but I'll tell you in Denmark, that's, that's more frequent. Um, and with that, uh, these pitches might have different surface qualities. 
they might have different maintenance um, levels and, um, and different hardnesses amongst other measures that we measure. Why is that important? Because with uh, food, well, with the different studs, we, we want to have an, an optimal grip for performance, but we also want to minimize risk of injury. If the traction is too high, we risk that the foot boot is getting stuck in the ground. Uh, and when you get stuck in the ground, you tend to sort of suffer from um, ligament and joint injuries. Or you, you can, um, if the traction is too low, you might end up sliding and risking injuring um, muscle and tendons. So you can, roughly speaking, uh, from a very sort of pessimistic perspective, choose whether you want to increase the risk of uh, joint and, and ligament injuries or muscle and tendon injuries, depending on the traction that you select. But it's not as simple as that because these definitions, soft ground, firm ground, artificial ground and turf ground, which all refer to a type of surface, are designed for adult men. There's no testing, there's no validation done on what an optimal soft ground football boot looks like for a woman. There's no optimal testing, uh, or optimal understanding of what a firm ground or an artificial ground football boot looks like for a woman in terms of traction and outsole design. So currently we don't know. And uh, put in a picture of Athol here because this is one of his main um, arguments and I, I, I completely agree with him and apologies for this turning out to a, a interesting language on, on the slides. But what it is meant to say on there, apologies for that, is that um, with, in terms of performance, we know that women have less power generation. We have less muscle mass, we produce less power. Um, so we don't necessarily need the same level of traction. And in terms of safety, we know that women have a much higher risk of ACL injuries than men. So why risk uh, the higher traction end of the spectrum where it, we, we put a, a higher risk of of joint and ligament injuries. Um, so overall, why, why would we put uh, a soft ground design on a, a woman uh, that isn't designed as a soft ground on the most aggressive outsole for highest traction on a woman when we can only assume from like logical reasoning that uh, a soft ground or high traction football boot probably isn't designed for the performance or the safety measures needed for women. And on top of that, I just wanted to flag another issue that we have. So, of course, with the traction, as I mentioned, it's an interaction between the surface and the shoe. We can do a lot of things to the shoe and optimize it, but currently we suffer a lot, especially in England. Um, it's up in the media all the time. These are very like recent images and, and newspaper articles saying that um, we have really poor pitch quality uh, for the players. One thing is that they play on less prominent um, stadiums, but uh, which sort of makes sense because they uh, attract less spectators um, at the current time being. But on top of that, they play on these stadiums, share it with uh, male football players. Women's game is normally played on a Sunday, whereas men's is played on a Saturday, meaning that a game has been played the day before and generally the, the pitches aren't maintained between the two games, putting the women at a really poor position um, playing their games on a worn out pitch that hasn't had time to recover from the previous game. So there's, uh, there's it's not just the football boots we need to change, the more issues than that when it comes to optimizing performance and safety uh, in relation to the, the football boot surface interaction. So with an outsole, to summarize, we need to understand like what optimal traction is for female players. We need to then understand how this traction varies depending on the surfaces. And we need to design outsoles for women and, and hopefully also optimize the quality of their pitches in the women's game. So, yeah, that was uh, a lot of issues highlighted. And this is the quest for um, women's football boots that I've been uh, meaning to talk about the whole day. So what do we actually do? Um, it's, I, I like this advert that I've seen from the Australian company designing women's football boots. And they say shrinking it and pinking it is not enough. So making it smaller and making it pink 
doesn't make it a woman's football boot. It's basically what they're trying to say. And I was thinking, yeah, okay, well, I know that we currently uh, shrink is where smaller size, and that's an issue. But do we actually pink it? Um, so last night before I presented, when finishing the presentation, I Googled girls' football boots, and these were the images that popped up. So yeah, uh, apparently this is the stage we're currently at. We shrink it and we pink it. And that's a football boot for a woman, apparently, according to the different brands. So yeah, uh, going back to our three sort of key points to sort of start solving this. From a research perspective, we need to ask questions. We need to go out. We need to listen to the players and the staff working in the women's game. We need to assess and we need to act. We can do that in multiple ways, but the ways that we've talked about in the group is we would love to have a survey that which we're currently trying to implement in some of the best leagues in, in the world um, with the players and the staff on their satisfaction, their concerns and their current issues with the football boom market. We need to understand um, the foot of the female football player. So we need to understand the anthropometry globally. So we need to understand it from the Caucasian, from the Black, from the Asian, from the Australian, from the South uh, American, from every single player, ideally, to understand what requirements we have from football boots in terms of fit. We need to suggest some design focuses, which is I've started on in this presentation today, uh, having that conversation with the manufacturers. And we need to then develop prototypes, assess them and validate them. However, I fear that this is going to look a bit more like the men's world, um, world of football boot design. Um, and we might be lucky enough to be able to suggest a design focus for the manufacturers, but then they will develop their football boots, put them on the market, and then we can assess and validate them after they've been released. So there are two options there. I hope it will be the top one. Um, but we are, uh, as a team, working on ensuring that while some fear that the, the bottom one could be um, the solution, at least for some companies. And it's not just us as researchers who need to do something. So here's uh, um, the, and in, uh, the link that we currently see between the sponsor and the player. Um, and with that, we in recent years have seen that there's a financial sponsorship um, for elite female players. They then get to do some advertisement and they get some money for doing it, which is ideal because as a female football player, we know they don't earn as much as men do. So even um, these relatively small um, uh, money offers uh, can be a really important financial gain for um, a female football player. With that, they might also feel that they're obliged to like what they're given um, by the, the sponsor and not ask questions or be critical because they're afraid of losing them or they're afraid of upsetting them. But we know that football boots are a performance enhancer and safety measure um, when basing it on men's football boot research. So we need to educate our players on what their rights are in terms of how they can challenge and question their football boot market. I've acted as a as a, a middleman between these two before, and generally speaking, the brands are really welcoming and keen to help if needed. So they will reach. You can reach out to them and have a really constructive conversation. I've never heard of uh, anyone just turning down a complain or concern from a player. So instead of the concerns that the female player has, we need to educate them and make them aware that they can speak up. And if they don't speak up and make the brands aware of their concerns, then um, there's less chance that things are actually going to change. So one thing is that we might speak up as researchers and try and assess and quantify how big these issues are with fit and design. But if the, the players and the medical staff or the staff within the clubs don't speak up and talk to the manufacturers, then very little is probably going to happen. So aiming for a better future, well, hopefully we'll have a design for women I hope we'll have an ethnical um, consideration when designing football boots. And we have to change our perception of football boots from a fit 
um, preference over the marketing claims that football boot manufacturers currently sell their football boots on, or football boot dreams on, I should say. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts, your questions, and your comments. Um, and just a quick advert for uh, the paper that we've uh, published on uh, on how to select the best football boot, no matter whether you are a female, a male, a child, a, an adult. And um, this should be advice in there for everyone. Yeah.